Hi, so welcome back. Uh, in this video, we will learn about the case of resonance for a second order linear ordinary differential equation with zero input or the external force being zero, uh, which uh, in, in mathematical terms would be called a homogeneous second order linear differential equation. So let's just write that down. This is a homogeneous A homogeneous equation. Here x is a function of time, so x double prime is a double differentiation of x with respect to time. Uh, x prime obviously is a, is differentiation of x one time with respect to t. Uh, now this and b and c are just constants. Um, however, I just want to uh, take you back to the model from which this differential equation actually came. So we discussed that this differential equation, second order linear differential equation, was modeled on a body being suspended from a spring where the distance from the ceiling up to the middle of the body, you can think of this body as a point particle, uh, is x. And so obviously uh, we are measuring x from upwards to down. Uh, so this is the, the acceleration or the force uh, because it's multiplied by the mass and there is a spring constant k uh, which gives the stiffness of the spring and this quantity here eta x prime is the air resistance or it is uh, the friction so as the as the body moves up and down as the body you know oscillates it experiences some kind of friction. So that is the term, the frictional constant is the eta. And obviously this differential equation comes from, the B actually comes from uh, eta by m. So it gives the, the air resistance or the friction, that's what it represents. C uh, represents uh, this term, k by m, which, is, which gives the stiffness of the spring. Okay, how strong the spring is. So obviously, as we have learned in, in some of the previous videos, that uh, the solution for this differential equation would be uh, some constant C1 times exponential of M1t, M1 is, is a quantity, it's given here what it is, plus C2, another constant times exponential of M2t. And that would be the general solution. Uh, where m1 and m2 are roots of the auxiliary equation. So if you remember from the previous, from the video where we had solved this differential equation, uh, the auxiliary equation is just an equation in the variable m or any other variable, uh, where the x double prime is replaced by m square, x prime is replaced by m and x is replaced by one. So that's the auxiliary equation and the two roots of this quadratic equation in m are the two roots m1 and m2 which feature in the in the general solution. So that that's the solution. If somebody asks you to solve this differential equation, that's the general solution of obviously c1 and c2 are constants, which will depend on what kind of, of a problem you're dealing with. Uh, right, so if you break this up in terms of the, the constants given in this quadratic equation, m1 I'm taking to be uh, this is just the solution of a quadratic equation minus b by 2 plus the square root of b square minus 4c by 2. So I'm taking the plus the positive square root in b in m1 and the negative square root in m2. So that's the setup for the case that we're going to study, uh, resonance. Now what happens is this case resonance comes uh, or, or happens when we take the case, we take this case that in this, in these two roots, m1 and m2, uh, suppose the quantities b and c, that is the stiffness of the spring and the air resistance or the frictional constant are such that b square is equal to 4c. If, if this quantity, in other words, this square root is zero, in that case, uh, something happens and that case is called resonance. So when this happens, when the case that b square is equal to 4c happens, obviously these two quantities, the p 
plus square root and the negative square root will become zero. So m1 and m2 are both minus d by two and so they're equal. So in this case, m1 is equal to minus d by two and so is m2 and so they're equal. Uh, in fact, just to make, we don't want to keep on writing b by two, we just call it, let's just give it a name, r, let's say r is b by two. Okay, so in other words, m1 and m2 are both equal to minus of r. Okay, so m1 and m2 are both equal minus of r because r is b by 2. All right, uh, now this is the case that we are studying when the two roots, when the two roots of this auxiliary equation are equal and in this case they're equal to minus r. Uh, that's the case of resonance. So, now, obviously, if somebody asks you to solve this differential equation in the case of resonance, the inclination is to, because we already know what the general solution is, the inclination is to, uh, to replace m1 and m2 by minus r because that's what they are. And then you would have the general solution and that would solve the problem. But we have to look a little closely here because this case really demands some closer look. Um, if m1 and m2 are replaced by minus r, is that really the general solution or is that a valid general solution? So what we do in this case is we also investigate what the constants c1 and c2 are, okay, because the situation demands so. We haven't seen that in the previous cases, but at least in this case we have to. And let's just do that. So, right, I'm just going to rub all of this out, keep the solution here, and we will right now investigate what C1 and C2 are, okay? The constants, how do they look like? Or what do they look like? So, um, right, now the first thing that we can do is to take the displacement of this body at time zero. So at time t, the displacement is x, okay? Uh, at time zero, uh, it is x zero, which is the displacement of the body at time zero. And so if you put t equals zero in this equation, the right hand side, you will get c1, e to the power zero is one. And again, e to the power zero is one. So you have c1 plus c2. Uh, now, that's not enough to solve C1 and C2. We need another equation. So we can look at the initial velocity of the body, which is the velocity, the differentiation of x with respect to t at time t equals zero. And so, so let's differentiate the right hand side. You, ha you will have the m1 and the m2 coming down. The exponentials will remain because the differentiation of an exponential is still an exponential. But if you're putting t equals zero, those exponential terms will become one. So basically you have m1 c1 plus m2 c2. Now you have two equations from which you can solve c1 and c2. So let's just do that quickly. So if I want to find c1, I will have to eliminate c2. So to do that, I'll multiply the first equation by m2 and I will subtract the second equation from m, m from the first equation. So what I will have from the left hand side, I will multiply this by m2 and then I will subtract this. And on this side, the c2 variable that vanishes and you're left with c1 into m2 minus m1. So that would come down here. You have m2 minus m1. Correct. Uh, so C2 will be found out exactly the same way. Uh, so you have M, now you have to just have to replace M2 by M1 because you're, you're uh, eliminating C1. So you multiply this one by M1, X0 minus X prime zero. And in the denominator, you now have M1 minus M2, but let's just write M2 minus M1 with a negative sign in front. So those are the two values of C1 and C2. So really, if I want to write this down, 
uh, well, we, we already know what they are. C1 is this and C2 is this. So the problem was, so can I replace, so if you remember, M1 and M2 are both equal to minus R. So if I put M1 and M2 as minus R in the exponential terms, there's no problem. But if I, ha now if I look at C1 and C2, the denominators are the same. So there is a problem here. If you put m1 and m2 both as minus r, the denominators will vanish and you can't have zero in the denominator. The, the constants will be undefined. And so we, we are in trouble. We can't really just, just replace m1 and m2 by this negative r because uh, c1 and c2 will get jeopardized in that manner. Okay, um, right. So what do we do? So the way we tackle this problem is not by taking m1 equal to m2 because obviously there are problems there but we take m1 very close to m2 and see what happens okay so that's so we're talking limits here so we take the limit where m2 approaches m1 and m2 obviously is as close to m1 as possible okay uh, that's the case we study first and we we see where this general solution goes if m1 approaches m m2 approaches m1 and then finally if we get a sense of what is happening we can we can sort of make m2 equal to m1 by the limit and see whether we can find a general solution which is a valid one okay right so this is what we do we take limit m2 equals m1 so let's just write down quickly um, what is I'll just replace C1 and C2 by these. So I have, so it's a bit of a pain to write it out again, but we'll just do that. Um, this is your C1 e to the power M1t plus C2, but with a negative sign, uh, M1 x prime 0, oh, sorry, x0 minus x prime 0 divided by m2 minus m1 multiplied by e to the power m2t okay uh, we can we can regroup the terms a little bit where we can take x0 as the common factor from so the factor the other factor will be m2 into this exponential and m1 into that exponential so if i take x0 common i will have m2 e to the power m1 t minus uh, m1 e to the power m2 t and if I take x prime 0 as a, as a common factor from these two I will be getting negative x prime uh, I'm taking negative x prime common so I have e to the power m1 t from here negative e to the power m to t and the whole thing obviously is divided by m2 minus m1 in the denominator all right now what happens if i take the limit m2 approaching m1 uh, then the denominator obviously approaches zero but the numerator also approaches zero because now if i replace m1 m2 by m1 because that's they're very close so m2 approaches m1 so so effectively you have m1 e to the power m1 t and m2 again is replaced by m1 so again you have m1 e to the power m1 t so this this becomes zero similarly m2 becomes m1 and so now these two terms are equal so this one will vanish too so the numerator also approaches zero and so this is the classic zero by zero form of L'Hopital's rule okay you all know L'Hopital's rule from school so this is the limit zero by zero form and so we to, to solve this therefore to solve to take limit m2 minus m1 we have to apply L'Hopital's rule which is to differentiate the numerator and the denominator so I'll just so what we're doing basically is uh, we're not only taking this uh, to find the solution 
when m2 and m1 are equal we are taking limits not just this okay so what we're doing is i'll just write that out here uh, so we are actually taking limit where m2 approaches m1 and here also we're taking limit m2 approaching m1 okay so that's what we're doing we're finding xt with this uh, trick of not making m1 and m2 equal but bringing them very close right so let's apply uh, L'Hopital's rule for zero by zero form so differentiate the numerator and the denominator with respect to m2 because m2 is the variable here and m1 is the constant the variable approaches the constant so we will differentiate both numerator and denominator with respect to m2 and let's just see what happens so I can rub out well I don't need these anymore actually so whatever space we have let's just do it there uh, so I'm going to continue here so what you have is so I'm differentiating the numerator with respect to m2 so this is a constant x0 remains what it is so this is from here to here okay and if I differentiate with respect to m2 this part is the constant because there is no m2 in this so and m2 becomes 1 so you have m1 uh, e to the power m1 t okay let's just rub this out as well because by now you all know what we're doing um, and then uh, minus I'm differentiating with respect to m2 so this m1 is a constant now this t is a constant with respect to m2 and we are differentiating with respect to m2 so this t comes down as a constant factor and so you have e to the power m2 t minus x prime 0 here there is no m2 so that just becomes 0 if you're differentiating with respect to m2 and then negative again the same problem as here the t here is a, is a constant factor which comes down so you get t e to the power m2 t and in the denominator if I'm differentiating with respect to m2 I'll just get 1 and m1 and 0 from m1 uh, again I just have to write down that what we're doing is a limit it's the limit m2 going to m1 right so let's just solve that I'm not worried about so this is not in zero by zero form anymore because I already have a one in the denominator so let's just put m2 equals m1 wherever we can in the numerator and see where this goes so x0 e to the power m1 t minus m1 t e to the power well there is m2 so i'll just replace that by m1 t because we are taking m2 going to m1 um, minus well this is zero so this negative and this negative will give me a positive uh, x prime zero t e to the power m1 t because there is m2 and we are replacing that by m1 so that's what we have let's just uh, rearrange this a little bit there are two functions one is e to the power m1 t and the other is t to the power m1 t so let's just write that down so you have x0 e to the power m1 t coefficient of the first function and the second function is plus x prime 0 from here and negative m1 x0 into t e to the power m1 t that's the second function so this is what you have if I can just replace the constants by very simple terms m e to the power m1 t where m is this constant and this whole constant here is replaced by n t e to the power the second function m1 t 
So that's the solution of the differential equation. So that, that, that was the differential equation. That's the solution. When we have resonance, in other words, the two, uh, the two roots m1 and m2 are the same. So actually, if because m1 was minus r, let's just replace that, and I can take e to the power minus r common. So I have e to the power minus r t, and here I'm left with m plus n t. Right, that's the more concise solution, okay? In the case when the two roots of the auxiliary equation are the same, in other words, b squared is equal to 4c. Now, let's just do one very quick analysis of this. Um, why the case is very interesting in the solution, this is the solution, this is the general solution. It's no more in the C1 exponential plus C2 exponential form. The two functions are different here. The, the second function is not exponential anymore. It's t to, into an exponential. So that's the general solution of this differential equation in the case when there is resonance. Uh, we'll just do a very quick analysis of this uh, solution and see why this case of resonance is very interesting. Um, I'll just rub all of this out, I'll just keep. So let's just clear the board. And in the case when m1 is equal to m2 or b square is equal to 4c, in that case, uh, the general solution is uh, xt equals e to the power minus rt. Um, m plus n t where r is minus b over 2 this b okay right that's the general solution now if you see there are two factors here one is the decaying factor this is the exponential part but with the negative index um, so this part decays as time goes on as as you increase t uh, this factor becomes closer and closer to zero it's a positive number but it becomes closer and closer to zero. Uh, however, this becomes, this shoots off. As you increase t, this is a linear polynomial or a linear function, polynomial of degree one. Uh, this increases with time. So there are two factors, one increases, the other decreases. But as we know, in such cases, because the exponential is always the dominating one, so eventually this function of time will decay because the dominating part, which is the exponential, will decay. But however, if r is very small, then what might happen is that it may take a little time to start decaying. In other words, the decay can be, the rate of decay could be very slow. So up to a certain point, this could be the dominating factor. So in that case, if I draw the graph of this uh, solution, general solution for this differential equation, if I plot uh, time along the horizontal axis and I plot xt, the solution, no, the displacement, the displacement of the body x at the time t uh, along the vertical axis, then, well, initially it is displaced by at time t is equal to 0, at t is equal to 0, uh, x0 was, so x at the point 0 was, uh, if I put 0 in the solution, I have e to the power 0, which is 1, n into 0, so this becomes 0, so you just have m, okay? So this is m, suppose, okay? At 0, uh, the function x is at a displacement m from the top, okay? Now, as I said, because this decaying is happening very slow, because r is very small, this polynomial of degree 1 being the dominating factor, and it is the increasing factor, increasing with time, up to a certain point, let's just call that t0, this solution, the product, will increase because this is dominating the whole product. But 
after the time t0 or from the time t0, when this now becomes the dominating factor in the product, because this is decaying, the function as a product will decay. And so it starts to decay from there on and obviously goes, you know, falls to zero at when time goes to infinity. So what is the implication of this when it comes to the physical um, movement of this of this body suspended from the ceiling by a spring? Uh, what this means is in such cases where there is resonance, uh, suppose I give it an initial displacement of m up to a certain time t0, the displacement of the body surpasses the initial displacement and in fact keeps on increasing till a certain height or length for the spring. And then it starts to slow down and then finally the displacement becomes almost zero so it'll, be, it'll get to us in a standstill, okay. So it's a strange case where the movement or the oscillation of the, of the body suspended by the spring will exceed the initial displacement that is given to it and then it will happen for a, for, a, for, a certain, for a certain while before it then comes to sense, you know, once this factor kicks in and then it sort of slows down and it comes to a standstill because as time goes on, the displacement falls to zero. So there is no displacement at the end. So in the middle, in the middle there, that's the crazy part of the resonance, okay? It's amazing how the displacement can become more on its own, okay? And I said it's crazy because one of the most famous examples of this resonance happening in real life is the was the Tacoma bridge collapse. Um, bridge collapse, uh, which happened in the US in Washington in the 1940s, where the bridge uh, sort of picked up some kind of an oscillation because there was a wind blowing. And then the conditions were such that there was resonance, you know, the, the, the R factor here was very, very low. So, you know, lots of things which gave to resonance and then the movement, the oscillation picked up on its own and became so big, you know, bigger than what the initial oscillation was or the initial displacement was. And then finally, it could not hold, hold its own together and then the whole thing collapsed. It was a very famous example of what resonance can do. Uh, I think I'll put a link of this incident if it's available. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's resonance and it's a very interesting case. So we will finish with that here and we will continue things uh, in the next few videos. Thank you.